Hey everybody, I'm Rick Beato. This is Red Shull. Today we're going to be talking about brand loyalty and if it actually means anything anymore. Uh, no. Well, yes. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> maybe. I don't know. When I say brand loyalty, I mean, you know, Slash plays Gibson Les Pauls or... John Mayer plays Strats. John Mayer plays Strats. Or when I built the studio here, the first thing people asked when they were coming into a studio that wasn't a commercial studio is, do you have Neves? Now, they didn't even know what Neves were, but that was an important thing. That was a brand. Do you have Neumann Mikes? Those were brands that meant something to them, that, that gave the studio legitimacy. Yeah. Regardless of whether there are, are other mic pre's or microphones that are just as good or better. Like the Earthworks SR30 condenser mics or the Burl B1 or B1D 500 series mic pre's. Well, I mean, there's, there's multiple things to unpack in that one statement. So let's start with guitars and guitarists. So Slash plays Les Pauls, uh, John Mayer plays, well, now a PRS Strat, which, you know, we've been through that whole controversy. I think in that respect, it, it does sort of matter with the older generation of players, right? I, I still think it would be weird if Slash switched from a Les Paul today and started playing a PRS or something. Um, and you know, it was kind of weird going back to John Mayer. It was a little weird when he first started playing with dead and company to see him playing a semi hollow PRS. Now he's kind of adopted that, but with younger players, guys that are now coming up, uh, in the game to, you know, the next generation of virtuoso players, I don't really see that specific brand loyalty. When I think of, about guys like, um, Joey Landreth, for example, no relation to Sonny Landreth. He, I don't think of him as like, oh, he's the total Les Paul guy or a total, you know, like Derek Trucks is an SG guy. Mm -hmm. I, I've the only other thing I've ever seen Derek Trucks play was a, a gold top Les Paul when he breaks a string on his SG, you know. But with younger guys, I don't really see that anymore. Well, it's interesting because I. When I was making one of my guitar historical videos, uh, 1970, 1979, or even the, the 29 to 69, I have a video of Jeff Beck playing a Les Paul. Now, Jeff yeah. Beck did play a Les Paul, yeah. but when you think of Jeff Beck, you don't think of a Les like, Paul. Think of a Strat. Think of a Strat. Yeah. Many guitarists back in the day, Peter Frampton plays a Les Paul, a three-pickup Les Paul, or he did on Frampton Hems Life. Well, he also played a Strat. Mm -hmm. I mean, he played multiple guitars. Yeah. Just so happens that he was on the cover playing his three pickup Les Paul. Right. Or or Clapton, I think, is a good example of someone who has transitioned through the years. I mean, you think about the the Beano sessions, the Mayall a Blues Breaker record. That was a 335, and he was a 335 guy for a long time. And then playing with Cream, he had his his SG. And then in the 80s and late 80s, early 90s, he switched to a Strat. You know, and and I guess he's still kind of a Strat guy to this day. So I think in that respect, yeah, brand loyalty matters with maybe older generations. Brand loyalty or brand or brand identification. Right. This in the new metal movement, if I were to say what were the two what was the, what was the guitar that was part of the new metal movement? PRS. PRS. Yeah. And what were the amps that were part of the new metal? Mesa. Mesa. Yeah, okay. for sure. That was Dual Rex, Triple Rex. Dual Rex and Triple tri, Triple Rex. That took a long time I think for them to shake those. Yeah. Both those companies, it took a while to shake that. They were so strongly identified to that movement that it was hard to get people to endorse and or start playing those guitars or people of note. Yeah. Well, I think that was part of part of the part of that was the brands themselves, the companies themselves. You know, PRS in the you know early two thousands, turn of the century, really was pushing. They were putting their guitars in the hands of the new metal players, and it, it worked for them from a marketing perspective almost too good because now, even today, when I think of a PRS guitar, you know, outside of maybe Carlos Santana, my immediate thought is new metal guys. And, and now I've seen PRS specifically has started to transition to more like country players, like commercial country guys. It's interesting because I, I thought, I used to think that about PRS until probably about six, seven years ago. I think that they started to, uh, th that just has become a brand that, that I don't really necessarily associate with, with anything like that anymore. It's interesting. But Mesa, I feel like, was held back yeah. 
by by new yeah. metal. Whereas PRS seemed to to glide. They've with they've overcome yeah. that, and and that's I think a testament to their marketing team and kind of the vision of Paul. Even through this whole John Mayer stuff that's been happening in the past year, they've still I mean they've sold a lot of those Silver Skies, you know, and every one of those John Mayer Super Eagle semi hollow guitars they made for I think like eleven thousand or twelve thousand dollars they've sold all of those you know so I will say this too not to interrupt but anybody can say anything they want about the John Mayer guitar but seeing it in person the pick guard and I I'm not a cosmetic kind of guy you know right. that right I don't care about that <laughs> yeah. the pick guard <laughs> and the painting paint job look so good together it's unbelievable well the interesting thing that i learned about because i did a video over on my channel compare i have a john mayer strat one of the actual fender black one strats and i did a direct head-to-head -head comparison between my strat and a silver sky and in the video i talked about like man this paint color looks like it belongs on a car and i learned from a commenter that they're actually tesla paint colors like uh, on, on, on the on the silver sky, yeah, okay. they're, they're Tesla colors that you yeah. get on the Model Three. I mean, that. it is beautiful the yeah. paint job on it, and yeah. and the the combination, the white on white pit guard. It's hard to make that look good. Yeah, and it really matches perfectly. Yeah, yeah. Traditionally, I'm not a big fan of the stark white pit guards, especially on black strats, because I feel like it makes it look cheap. You know, it, to me, it, it calls to mind like a you, something you'd get on a Squire, but. That silver that they have, that red that they have, I think is a really sharp color. But going back to what we were talking about a second ago, Mesa, I don't think, has done a good job of moving past that uh, that identification with being a new metal brand, heavy metal kind of guitar brand. For me, that's not the style of music that I play, and so I tend to shy away from Mesa amps because in my mind, I just associate them with really heavy guitar sounds and so i don't go for me uh, so my brother called me this morning and told me there's a new mesa amp out called the fillmore 50. the name fillmore On to me that's what i think i think yeah. fillmore i think actually i think of all classic rock because right. there's so many fillmore right concerts there yeah just in the name that brand name is brilliant yeah i haven't heard anything about the amp i've not seen it he told me he played through it and it sounded great so, okay, yeah, this is a good example. I don't know anything about this amp, but just from the name, my initial thought is like, oh, is it their version of a Plexi, like a 100-watt Plexi or 50-watt Plexi, something that, um, you know, Dwayne Allman would have played? Is that... I don't know. I have no thing. <laughs> okay. I don't know. My brother said it. He played it. It was a great amp. He really liked it. And uh, we, we, we talked for about two minutes this morning, and I thought, <laughs> and I said to him, wow, that's a great name. Yeah. And I thought great branding right, right there because any other name, every name gives you a. I mean, they had the transit transatlantic, right? The Electrodyne, they have the Stiletto, they have all these different brand names, but still, I, I guess their most popular amps are like the Mark Five, right? Mark Five, yeah, and uh, the the Dual Rec and Triple Rec, and both of those amps are kind of synonymous with you know the prog rock scene. Um, or, or just regular. I mean, Dave Grohl, oh, you know, yeah. played, played dual rectifiers, and right. and, new, and 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 they're frankly, great amps, man. They're pop, yeah, pop punk, I mean, right. Blink One Eighty Two bands like that would play Mesas. Yeah. It was very common. Yeah, everybody played Mesas, or yeah. a lot of bands played Mesas from the mid two thousand mid nineties through the uh, through the early two thousands. Yeah, or mid and if you're trying to get that sound, man, they're great amps for that. But going back to what you're talking about a second ago with the studio stuff. I think that's an example of something that doesn't that brand loyalty doesn't matter as much with anymore. Right. You know, part you, of the tell, reason. Tell me this: you had a negative uh, to you Mesa's and PRS's because of new metal had a negative connotation. They had a negative connotation, um, but now you know the more experienced I get and the more of their gear I play, that that's kind of changing, and the way they're marketing their equipment is kind of changing that. But again, that's just because I'm not a new metal. Well, I, I just don't think that people even care about that as much. Not anymore. as much anymore. Um, and a good example of that is like the studio stuff you're talking about. Because nowadays, especially in the recording world, if you have a laptop and a decent mic and an interface, you can, and you know what you're doing, you can make a really great sounding record. Really you, great sounding right song. down to, to things like interfaces. Yeah. No one would have been caught dead 
using a Focusrite interface. Yeah. Focusrite made very high-end pieces of gear. If you go back to their red compressor, yeah. uh, people like Chrysler at LG would use. Or any of their reds, their their red series the, the has been around, and, the Mike Prees yeah, and, the, and right. compressors and things like that. And then they went through a period where they made really inexpensive yeah. gear. And now they've raised their bar. Yeah. Up to where I I think that they've resurrected their name by making higher, well higher quality. There's also I think they partially couldn't help that because there was a period of time through the early 2000s to now where there was a disconnect between, you know, the price of the technology in the digital recording world. Obviously, anything uh, electronic when it first comes out is really expensive, and there was a I think a period of time where brands like Focus right, Personas, and all these people were trying to open up the entry level recording market, but they couldn't get good quality converters. They couldn't get good quality preamps. Well, they in could. That, they just were too. They were right too in that price range, in that entry level yeah. price range. Well, now the the cost of manufacturing and all this stuff has come down to the point where, you know, my main interface at home that I use, that I make all my videos with and stuff, is a Focus right, like the the eighteen i twenty. It's a five hundred dollar interface. And it sounds great. Well, people used to, to say, what kind of interface do you have? I mean, yeah. when people came in here, do you have a, uh, you know, are you running Pro Tools? Do you have a, a 192? Do you have some type of a clock? I mean, people were, ba bands, they'd always have one guy that was more sophisticated. Yeah. I had a clock, a Universal Audio 2192, that was a converter, a two-channel converter, and it had a great clock on it, and, and, uh, People would notice things like that. I don't think now, nowadays, I don't think people notice anything. I could have a mothership in there and nobody would care. Yeah, because I think nowadays the technology has gotten so good. I mean, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, you needed to spend the money to get really good quality converters and really good quality clock because there was an audible difference between the high-end stuff and the low-end stuff. Now, it's kind of getting into, I think, a little bit of like the law of diminishing returns where... You want to get something that's ten percent better. You've got to spend sixty or seventy percent more on something. Where, you know, anything like a UA Universal Audio is a really good example. The Apollo series stuff. I think you could run a world class studio using an like an AP. Well, or case like case that. in point, I was doing a record. Probably, I'm not sure when the first the Apollo Eight came out. Probably seven eight years ago. Yeah, something like that. Two thousand ten, I think it was. Two thousand ten. So I was doing a session and my Pro Tools rig went down and it, there wasn't enough time to get it. I couldn't get a new computer or anything. It's just the interface went down. Yeah. I don't know, one of the cards or something. So I immediately went down to Guitar Center and I bought an Apollo 8. And within 10 minutes, it had the, the DB25 connectors in the back. Within yeah. 10 minutes, we were back up and running. Yeah. And the, I started, I realized then that, I mean, it, you know, it wasn't... There was a little bit of a learning curve because mm -hmm. we weren't used to recording like that. But I realized that, wow, this is going to replace eventually, which it has. Yeah. It replaces things like like the Pro Tools hardware. Right. And, of course, the plugins. You know I'm a huge fan of the UAD plugins. I own most of them, and I've been using them for years. And and getting back to like the, the brand loyalty thing, <clears throat> I think that now matters less. People aren't concerned with when they go to a studio, okay, what kind of interface, what kind of converters are you using? Because, you know, whether you're using Universal Audio or Antelope or something like that, it's all going to get the job done well. But I think what still matters, and you see this now in the boutique market, uh, boutique guitar world, boutique recording world, is the the Neumann name, the U87, the U67, 47, the Neve name, 1073, 1081, those names still matter because those sounds still matter. And now you have so many different companies in all different price brackets that are manufacturing versions of those. 1073s, yeah. 1081s, 1176s. So, well, of course, that begs the question, is Neve even Neve anymore? The AMS Neve is not the Neve of, of, your, uh, of my era. Well, you right. Know? And now there's like, what, two different Neves because you have... AMS Neve, and then you have Rupert Neve Designs, which is a different thing. Well, make and make they make different. Obviously, they're different. Uh, but BAE, for yeah, example, yeah. make 
incredibly good Neve 1073, 1084, 1066. Then they have their their 1028, 1032 models that have a, a you know 10 bands of, of mid range. People look at them and they look like Neves, and people don't even ask anything. Right. I mean, I don't honestly think that people. I don't think that they look at those things like they used to. They really don't. When people started to be able to afford home studios mm -hmm. and, and home recording gear, mo a lot of people in the early 2000s could afford maybe one mi nice mic pre, and they yeah. would own that. And they would do a lot of research. And every band that would come in, there'd always be one guy mm -hmm. that was that guy that was usually incredibly annoying, <laughs> and he would want to know everything about, every well, why are you using this? Yeah. Why aren't you using that? Why use an L uh, eleven seventy six on here? Yeah. Well, I yeah. read that an LA two A is better for the. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that was before my my time, I think, and I think part of the reason that brand loyalty matters less now is because, like my generation, we came up recording in the box. Yeah, we've talked about this before. Most of my, other than working here at your studio and interning for years, I was able to get my hands on good outboard gear. But had I not done that. My only experience as a young 20-something with no money trying to learn how to record would be plug-in versions of the real of the hardware. Things. I, I, I like to call them inboard gear. <laughs> inboard gear. <laughs> because we always use them to record into the computer right. and then would use plugins afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. So and or on onboard gear. Right. So in that in that case, it's I think not as important. That's why I think people aren't as worried about, oh, well, do you have Real 1073s? Are they vintage or are they modern? Are they vintage? Well, they've or also read. They've also had people, well-known producers, engineers that are famous that have come out with their own plugins and they say, <laughs> yeah. and they say, well, I don't hear any difference. Yeah. And when people hear that enough, yeah, that they, it begins to lose its importance to Marketing, them. Marketing man. Even if it's actually true. Yeah. I mean, I would much rather record through a 1073 mic pre than to record through a 1073 plugin. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Period. obviously. But, again, for somebody like me who's young and coming up, I might not be able to afford a BAE 1073, but I could spend the 100 bucks or whatever for the Sheps 73 from Waves, is you that, know. Is that how much it is, 100 bucks? <laughs> yeah, something like that. Well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's... And I think that's good and bad. The good side is it's getting more people involved in the recording process and more people getting their hands dirty actually making music on their own. I think that is a good thing. Downside is you it, it's harder to learn the actual gear and the actual because recording in an, an analog signal path is different than recording straight in the box where all you have is a mic and an interface and you're doing everything on your laptop. So brands that you would consider still have that that cachet. Yeah. Let's say in the guitar world. Let's say in the pedal world. Let's talk about that for a minute. Man, well, the pedal world is tough because, I mean, it's just exploded in the last 10 years. Um, so I think to start with the pedals, we should start with actual pedals that have that cachet. First and foremost comes to mind, Tube Screamer. Mm -hmm. Everybody makes a Tube Screamer. Um, yeah. Everybody makes a fuzz face. Everybody makes a big muff every generation of big mode. That's right. So I think those pedal designs are iconic and those much like we were talking about a second ago with the 1073s and 1081s, those designs matter as far as brand name goes. Everyone has a tube screamer on their board. Every But does the tube screamer actually the actual Ibanez tube screamer have more cachet, have more importance no. because of the name? No, because now the market is so diluted. Because everybody makes a Tube Screamer now, it's, okay, what flavor of Tube Screamer do you want? Do you want the JHS version that has every different type of, you know, different op amp chip in it? Or do you want the, you know, the Earthquaker Palisades? I mean, like, so I think, for me, if I'm buying a Tube Screamer, my initial thought is not to, to go straight for the actual Tube Screamer. It's to go boutique and try out all the different flavors of Tube Screamer. Um, so I don't think that matters as much anymore in, in the pedal world. But we were talking earlier about Boss pedals. Now mm -hmm. Boss, when, when pedals first started coming out, 
you had things, you had the Echo Plex, but let's, let's talk about just pedals. MXR was the first big company that was manufacturing pedals that were commonly bought. The Analog Chorus, mm -hmm. the Flanger, the Phase 90, those were staples. People had those, the Distortion Plus, mm -hmm. those were really, really common. I'm partial to those, I'm from Rochester, that's where they were made. Yeah. And those were the first, even before Boss, I believe, I wanna say that, that, that MXR was the first big pedal manufacturer. And, and you were saying that people still yeah. like those. Well, people those early brands, yeah, MXR, um, Electro Harmonics, Boss, Boss, right? It's funny, when, when I look at guys from, from an older, players from an older generation who have their board, even yeah, sometimes... Young, older than me. Older <laughs> generation. <laughs> um, I look at the way, I mean, you used to have a pedal board that was set up this way, where you have, would set it up still like it was from 1992, where it was, you know, a, a power strip and a bunch of wall warts, and you had this big, gigantic pedal board, where my generation is more into the smaller, more compact, with a power supply, everything's run clean, and now I'm seeing a transition from even guys who came up in my time from like you know the early 2000s and on to now everybody's shifting to these multi-effect pedals it started with the Kemper and and the Axe effects and now you have the Line 6 Helix and all these things that are these floor controller digital multi-effect pedals why though i mean my brother started was telling me he, last year two years ago the H9 oh yeah. i've replaced my stuff with an H9 yeah. And he just was raving about it. Oh, you can control it. You can change things from your phone. I put my phone on my stand. I change I change presets yeah. that way. Why, though? Why do people like this? I think it's this idea of convenience. Um, you're getting more bang for your buck, so to speak, in, in real estate on your pedal board. I have an H9. It's a great pedal. Um, it sounds great. And I think people are wanting to only be able to, only having to take one thing to a gig. I have my guitar and I have my multi-effect floor pedal that has amp sounds, every guitar. Convenience. Sound. Convenience, Convenience uh, generation here. And, and I'm experiencing a little bit of resistance to that. I get people commenting on my channel all the time like, oh, dude, you should just get a Helix or whatever. And for me, it's like, well, I like my pedal board. I like the way I have it set up. I don't necessarily want to switch to... The Helix, um, even though it probably sounds great and it's probably really convenient and easy to use, um, I'll probably end up getting one just to use on the channel anyways. But So it's interesting to see how these different generations of players are transitioning and how they record and how they play live and what they use and all that kind of stuff. So I have hundreds and hundreds of pedals. Mm -hmm. I just bought a pedal the other the, the other day that Rhett tried out here. It's the uh, what's it called, Rhett? The Bob. Uh, Let me go around it. <laughs> the Boonar. Boonar. Yeah. So I just bought this pedal because it's a Benson Echo clone, yeah. and I'm not endorsed by them at all. I heard that David Gilmour played one. It's very cool, man. And I started thinking about the Benson Echo after I interviewed Peter Frampton. He talked about that's what he played through as well. He said, me and my friend Dave Gilmour, we played through Benson Echoes. Which that whole sentence to me is mind-blowing. Yeah. yeah. My, my, my friend Dave Gilmour and I. We Dave played. Gilmour. Oh, Dave. Sorry. Dave. First name. <laughs> <laughs> so so my brother told me, my brother, uh, my brother John says, oh, yeah, you should check out this pedal. It's really cool. I watched a demo on it, and uh, you should really check it out. So I look it up. I was like, okay, I'll, I'll buy this. Mm -hmm. I watched one demo. Rhett's going to do a demo of the pedal that's way better than the demo that I uh, that I watch. I assume you're going to do a demo of it, right? Yeah, you're going to let me tell you with it? Yeah. Okay, cool. So uh, Rhett will do a, a far better demo that you guys should watch on it. And it's just so interesting. What, what were your first impressions of it? Well, when I first got it, I mean, obviously I've... He played, played with it for about 30 minutes or so. I, yeah, I, I was on it for 30 minutes, and it's a really... This is a really useful pedal for two things. One, I would like to actually do recording with this. You know, we talked about when the levee breaks, that drum sound was a... It's an, it's an echo, yeah. And so my initial thought Regardless is, of what people say in the comments section on my video about it. <laughs> right. So my initial thought was, okay, well, let's put this in a recording chain and an effects send 
and like push drums through it, push. And Rhett bass. said, "Well, I wish it was in stereo." And I said, "Why? They were never. They weren't in stereo." Yeah, I mean it. That's again my initial millennial <laughs> guitarist reaction. It's like, yeah, it needs to be stereo so I can get huge, huge effect feel. Um, and then the other thing too is I would like to put this after a fuzz pedal and just sit there and make. And in my demo, that's probably what I will do is use this as kind of like what I call a character effect, which is just something really unique that you can do some some interesting soundscape kind of stuff with. I, I need to spend some more time actually figuring it out because it's laid out a lot differently than your normal delay pedal. You have four different playback heads that you can switch between independently or all together. There's no tap tempo on here, so you have to dial it in independently, but it's a killer little pedal, man. So I have, we have a Kemper here, Axe effects, um, hundreds of, of pedals, hmm. and I like them all. Yeah, I do. I, I use them all. I used my Axe effects on a couple of videos recently. I use my amplifiers and a lot of my videos. Yeah, I've used the Kemper. We're actually making a Kemper profile. Uh, I'm profiling all of my amps with my assistant Ken. We're in the process of doing that. That's going to take probably another month or so. But um, we use all different things, and I embrace all these different technologies. Yeah. I think that they all have certain values to them, whether it's speed or flexibility yeah. um, or unpredictability. Yeah. Like this is, has that unpredictable. You don't know what you can get from that. To me, that's like... Well, we, we live in a golden age of gear right now in almost any aspect of the musical world but especially for guitarists and, and bass players Not, like, well i would say for pro audio as well yeah pro exactly pro audio i mean this is a golden age you can get some incredibly high quality great sounding stuff for not very much money there's more options out there than there ever have been as far in in guitars we haven't talked about you know guitar brand quite yet but i mean there's so many things from cheap entry level stuff that is that sounds great, you know, all the way up to really high end boutique. One guy in his garage making these, you know, holy grail amps or pedals or whatever, and everything in between. I mean, it's never been a better time to be a musician or a. Well, I think that the, the because of DAWs, yeah, and it started happening in the early two thousands because of the the people had the ability to have a studio with a high-powered computer, mm -hmm. have Pro Tools or Logic or Sonar or whatever people would use at the time, Cubase, a company started coming out with new microphones, yeah. new mic pre's. And then you have the 500 series, Yeah, what would you call it, form factor, where, where yeah. you have these modules that slide into a power supply. Yeah. And you have everything you can think of. You want a 1073? They got it. You yeah. want a Trident... A range mic yeah. pre, they got it. You want a knee API twenty two sixty four compressor, they yeah. got it. API five five fifty A five fifty B five sixty EQs, they got them. Anything you can think of now, they're made for five hundred series that you've never seen before. Or heard, I mean, there's now companies out there that are making new original designs or combinations of of all these things. So that, in addition to the microphones and other types of of gear that is made. For the front end of recording, mm -hmm. onboarding. Yeah, <laughs> inboarding. Inboarding. <laughs> um, so now I want to talk about guitar brands and guitar brand loyalty. We talked a second ago about how it's, you know, we have the players who are iconic and that might be changing. But what about guitar brands themselves? I personally don't feel any loyalty to, you know, I own Fenders, I own Gibsons, uh, boutique stuff. I don't feel a tremendous loyalty to any of the big name brands. Um, partially because I feel like some of those brands, Gibson in particular, aren't really making their best instruments in this era, in this age. Hopefully that's about to change with this new leadership that's coming in. But, you know, Fender, I think, is out of all the big box Fender's guitar. Yeah, Fender's doing probably the best. And and I would also throw Gretsch in there as well. Well, and PRS. And PRS, you know. PRS I think, are making their best guitars they've ever made. Right. 
you know, a while ago, in fact, I did a, a video about comparing uh, Righteous Guitars had one of the first PRS Custom 24s ever made. It was serial number 89. And I compared that one to a modern 2018 Custom 24. And uh, I'll you link the video in the description. But what I found was the newer one was way better than the older one. And from what I've seen about Paul Reed Smith, he will tell you that himself. Like, yeah, we've never made better guitars than we are right now. Every year. I like the 527. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually partial to the four. I said to Rhett the other day, I was I was saying, uh, Rhett said, what, uh, what PRS do you like? I said, I like that guitar, the 527. He's like, what is that one? You mean the 594? And I said, yeah, I like that one too. <laughs> They're both good. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think they could change their uh, their branding a little bit. <laughs> it's just confusing to, to stay on top of all the PRS models, but yeah. So I think PRS is a great example, and there's a lot of people that are definitely loyal to the PRS brand name. Yeah, but there's people that are loyal. I have my new Kiesel guitar yeah. that people uh, that I love that people are loyal to that brand. Um, you know why? Because that's a smaller manufacturer that people feel invested in. Mm. I'm lo I'm I have brand loyalty to my Novo guitars because that's a I have a personal relationship with the person who builds those guitars, right? I feel invested in that because my money, I can see when I purchase a guitar from them, that money is going directly into their company and helping them grow their brand. With with a bigger box brand like Gibson or Fender, you don't necessarily see that you know i haven't bought a guitar you know right you've been coming here for you say a few, three years you've been coming here for probably 10 Six, years yeah, something like that yeah <laughs> wow long enough i never <laughs> bought any new guitars never. ever never no all my guitars are i mean i've I, my oldest guitar that i've owned the longest is a guild classical that i bought in 1977 so i have a guitar that i bought in the 70s sitting wow. here um, and I've got some old guitars. I've got some new guitars, but my Gibson acoustic there is a 57. When I buy a guitar that's really good, I just keep it. But I have, an, I have many different brands of guitars. Mm -hmm. You go over there and you'll see Gretsch. You'll yep. see Fender. Mm -hmm. You'll see Gibson. You'll see Kiesel. You'll see Aria Pro 2. Uh, you'll Dan see Electro. Dan Electro. Yeah. Well, a few Dan Electros. Uh, and you'll see me play... These guitars, all these different guitars mm -hmm. on different videos. Yeah. I play a guitar that I think is going to make me play something interesting. Right. E either that or I want to be historically accurate. When I do a video and I'm doing the solo to Stairway to Heaven, it was right. done on a Telecaster. Right. So I'm going to play a Telecaster on it. Now, I don't have an SG now, so I did play, play Back in Black. It's sacrilegious. I played it on Les Paul. Although no one mentioned it. But well, I specifically did not watch that video because you didn't play <laughs> SG. So. But I put Angus in the picture <laughs> playing his SG. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's they're all just tools, man. They're tools for a job. And it doesn't, I'm personally, it doesn't matter to me what you play or what you don't play, what you're into, what, you, what you're not into. Because it's so subjective, especially a guitar. I'd say of all the gear that we use, Guitars are the most subjective things because you have a, a really personal interaction with that instrument. And so you, you pick a guitar up based on what you want to say, what you want to get across, what you're trying to do, uh, or to be historically accurate. Um, but that's why I don't think that kind of brand loyalty matters as much in the guitar world. You know, I when I was going through the... Uh with the Kiesel guitar when they were asking me, well, what's the neck radius that you want? And I asked Dave, and he said, oh, you like flat radiuses, 18, something like that, 18 or 20. But that's actually not true, because my 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 Gibson's there. I've got the 56 reissue, and I have the, the my black Les Paul. Mm -hmm. And the Les Pauls are, what, 12 radius? I think so, yeah. And or those play incredibly well, too. Yeah. I don't... it. So there are so many elements to how a guitar plays, yeah. how it's set up, the kind of frets it has. That that to me, when I played the Silver Sky, which is what a seven radius or something, seven and a half, yeah, or seven and a quarter. And 
I didn't notice it being odd at all. It played yeah. great. Right. And that was one thing with that guitar in particular that the internet was freaking out about was, oh my God, it's it's got that vintage, you're not going to be able to play it. And the reality is, no, if it's set up properly, it plays great. You just have to have the guitar set up for that that radius. But you're so right. Like, There's so many little minute factors that go into making a great guitar, a great guitar, and that's not... Uh, there's not a direct correlation between price and guitar quality or or playability. You may have, you know, obviously a more expensive guitar will have better construction and may, might be made of better materials. But I talk about this this all the time. Jack Pearson is a Nashville guitarist who's one of the the best guitarists I've ever seen live. He has some of the best guitar tone I've ever heard. The man is is mind blowing. He plays a stock off the shelf Squire Strat. The only mod that he does is he changes, he has one that has a black pick guard with black knobs and he changes the volume knob to a white one so you can see it better on stage. <laughs> <laughs> we, we did the Joe Bonamassa Blues Cruise a couple years ago uh, with one of the bands I was in and, and he was on that cruise and I watched every one of his sets. He played a whole show with that Squire Strat with a stock tube screamer sitting on top of a deluxe reverb. Well, that just goes to show you that it's all in the fingers. Yeah, and it was some of the best guitar playing, the best sounding guitar tone I've ever heard. You know. All right, so we want to know what you think. Do you think brand loyalty matters anymore, or are you loyal to one brand in particular? You will only buy their gear, or only play their guitars. Leave your comments in the comments section. Rhett's channel is... YouTube.com slash Rhett Shull, link down below. And don't forget to subscribe here. Thank you all for watching.